Hey everybody, Ben here for the Bonehead Podcast, and welcome to Theory Thursday Side Cage Tactics. So Theory Thursday, we get together and we take a deep dive into one part of Blood Bowl. Whether it's stats or strats, we go deep and find out just what we can learn about the best game out there with a kind of vain hope that maybe we can get a little bit better at it and win more. So we are going to be talking about side cage tactics today. Side cages or launch pads, I, I call them launch pads too, are a risky tactic in Blood Bowl. If you've watched any of the Bowhead Championship, you will know that I love this tactic. This is an elf, a skaven, absolute baseline tactic. It can go wrong, but it's important to know how to cheat it and how to beat it. So we're going to take a look at side cages. So we should probably start off by talking about what a side cage is. So what is a side cage? A cage in Blood Bowl is where you've got the ball carrier and you've got additional defenders all around so that there is no direct way to blitz the ball carrier. There's always leaping, there's always dodging, but where you've got so many overlapping tackle zones, it's very negative for that to happen. It can definitely happen, but you're creating a solid barrier for your opponent. And what's more likely to happen is they're going to end up blitzing a dude off the corner and end up on the ball carrier after that. So a cage is a, is a formation to protect your ball carrier. And a side cage uses the sideline to free up a couple of extra players. So we've got a side cage right here where the ball carrier is there and you've got two additional blockers surrounding him. So you've got these tackle zones here which protect your ball carrier from multiple different angles, okay? If they want to go in here, you've got two tackle zones. If they want to go here, you've got to go one into two tackle zones to get to the ball carrier. So the whole point of a cage, whether it's a side cage or a standard cage, is to just make it as hard as possible for your opponent to hit the dude with the ball. Now, in Blood Bowl, it is never impossible to hit the guy with the ball. Assuming that they're within movement distance, you can roll sixes and wander through tackle zones and punch a guy all day long. So one of the first things you've got to be aware of with the side cage is, yes, it's difficult to get to the ball carrier. But you're on the sideline, and this is why the side cage is such a risky tactic. It just takes a really fortuitous pair of dodges to get a block on your ball carrier and get them off the pitch. So the first thing to know about the side cage is, yeah, it's risky because you are on the sideline. Part of its strength is also part of its weakness. Now, what we've got here is the layout of the pitch. So when you are building a side cage or a launch pad, as I sometimes end up calling it, you need to count out the pitch. I have lost more than more than a few games because I haven't counted out right and I've missed it by a square. So there's the red zone and then there's the amber zone. The amber zone is close enough for your ball carrier to score with one or two rushes. OK, you can do it, but it's going to be risky. It's worth knowing where that is. The red zone is where you can just walk it in with no go for it, no rushes you will maybe have to have some dodges but we'll come to that in a second but the point is here you need to count it out so in this circumstance here we've got a movement seven catcher ball carrier basically so this could be a human blitzer this could be any wood elf lineman this could be a skaven thrower plenty of players have movement six so what this is saying is that you are in the red zone now of that player's movement which means if you start your next turn past this red line you can go one two three four five six seven touchdown okay now what we're saying with the movement seven player here is if they were here then they would be able to do it with go for it's one two three four five six seven rush and rush now rushing into the end zone with the ball it's technically a two plus but you've got at least 150 percent chance of failing that roll trust me trust me Okay, so you've got those two zones and you need to be very aware. Now, if you're playing offense or if you're playing defense, you must be aware of where those zones are because if your opponent is standing here, they cannot score. They just can't score, okay? There may be some potential chain pushes to get you those extra squares of movement, definitely. But if they are past that red line, if they are in the red zone, you need to stop them. And if you are in the red zone, you are able to score immediately. Now, if you are using the stalling rules and as Blood Bowl 2020 kind of develops, we will potentially see the stalling rules come in um, more to play. Then actually the difference between the Amazon and the red zone will be very important. But for now, the red zone is where you score from. So you've got range and you've got protection. And the whole point here of the side cage is to run through 
cage up for a turn and then break through and score. So why would you run a side cage? A side cage is the perfect opportunity to score in two turns. Okay, it is risky because you are putting it all out there and if it goes wrong, you're in the you're in dire straits. But the side cage tactic is very common with fast teams. Wood Elves, Skaven, and as we've demonstrated, any team here with pretty much movement 6 or movement 7 is good to go when it comes to the side cage. So the side cage will come into play if you need a two-turn score. This is a very effective way of doing it because it gives your opponent one opportunity to counter strike. Now we're going to look at forming a side cage and we are going to look at countering a side cage because it's really important that you understand one and the other element because they will, it will be very useful on both sides of the board. But when it comes to the side cage, it is kind of a desperate tactic. I'm a big fan of scoring fast with agility teams. It is not the right tactic, and I guess I should probably say right now, the side cage is very risky and is not a good tactic in Blood Bowl. It leaves you... You will probably have to get a couple of rushes to form your side cage deep enough into the pitch. You will probably then have to make some bad blocks to get there on this, to get there or to get through on the next turn but it is effective. Now, I am not opposed to opening with a two-turn touchdown because actually then I get to play 14 turns of defense and I love playing defensive Blood Bowl. It's kind of where my strength is. So if I can bust through, score quickly, it puts the pressure on the opponent. But generally speaking, it will leave you vulnerable and it's a risky tactic. But you're a madman or quite frankly, you've got two turns to score. Now, any team with movement five players can score in two turns with a dude starting on the sideline. Five, rush, rush, five, rush, rush. OK, so this tactic is valid for absolutely any team. So including dwarves, what you are affected by is the support players. So uh, if we look down here. In fact, I think what I might have to do is just get rid of the logo for a second because you are in the way of our illustration. You will see the pieces that are needed to form a side cage. There are a couple of elements. When we talk about playing offense on Blood Bowl, you've got the line of scrimmage, you've got your scoring contingent, your blitzing contingent, and you've got the retrieval team, right? You collect the ball, you hand it off. When you are playing side cage, you will need a couple of fast elements in your backfield to be able to pick up the ball. Now, this is where the Skaven team really shines. You've got a great passer, potentially the best thrower in the game, and you've got gutter runners who are edge 2 plus with movement 9 and dodge. So actually, you've got a huge amount of coverage in the backfield. The ideal formation to form a side cage if you are going for a two-turn score is what we call um, the, the heavy side um, setup. So when you've got a heavy on heavy right or a heavy left formation, basically what it means is, and we've got a kind of demonstration here, you've got a lot of stacked players on one side. Now, if the ball lands here, you're stuffed. And this is where the risk of the side cage two-turn touchdown comes in, because if the ball does land here and you've got no one to get it, and you've got no one to get it over here, then actually you're in trouble. You can form a side cage at any point during the game. So this is not just a two-turn tactic. Okay, this is not just a two-turn touchdown tactic. But what it is, is this is where you will see it most. This is going to be a turn seven kind of option. Or, you know, like I said, you're trying to be cheeky and score nice and quick. Or you just are breaking through. But we're going to talk about how to set this up from the line of scrimmage over a course of two turns. So the elements that you will need to sort to form this side cage is one, getting hold of the ball. And we've touched on that. You need some fast players in the backfield to limit that. But then you want to stack your players heavy on one side. Now, there's a couple of cool tactics, a couple of cool tricks here. The first thing you need to do is count how far your players can go. If you've got movement eight, movement nine catches, the field gets a lot bigger. If your team, if you're playing Amazons and you're stuck at movement six, um, you're playing Snotlings and what you do have is a couple of stilty runners with sprint, you can kind of bake that in. And what you then need to do is adjust your red and amber zone to make sure that you're happy with where you're scoring. You don't need to break through all the way here, okay? You can end up anywhere that is going to leave you with enough movement squares in the next turn. The red zone makes it safer because what might happen is you might have to bounce out a couple of squares to get back on. And that's the great thing about using this as a marker here, is if your opponent ends up just stacking players here and you need to go around, you can go one, two, three, 
four and you can break out it gives you an extra couple of squares using rushes to be able to do that sometimes making those two plus rushes is going to be better than making three plus four plus dodges so it's a very useful thing so the first thing you got to do is judge how fast you are then you need to get your carrying contingent ready there will be two phases to this once you've got the ball okay one get the ball get it to the ball carrier then you need to blitz through We'll look at how to use this tactic against uh, two of the most common formations, the Anchor and the Chevron. Now, the Anchor, if your opponent has stored here all his players in this zone here, then you don't need to worry about blitzing through. What your job will be is to collect the ball, get it to your carrier, and it's important to try and do that while you've still got a defensive front. If it's the end of the half, it doesn't matter quite so much, but the last thing you want to do is move your dudes up and then have your ball in the open with your opponent having two turns to counter score not what you want to do you want to get the ball to your ball carrier if not it's actually pretty well defended by your 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 strong front your heavy one-sided offense your flank heavy flank offense that's what i called it okay so the phase one is get it to the ball then phase two will be to blitz through and make a hole make the pocket make the cage make the launch pad for your ball carrier to get to so in this circumstance here our blitzer who is unopposed at the moment we are definitely going to look at some opportunities in a minute on how to make opportunities to become unopposed. But as it stands, let's say your opponent's here. What are you going to do? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Bring this guy up here. Bring the catcher into the pocket. And then what you can do, and this is probably the most important thing about the side cage, this is the minimum that you need. What you then have to do is use your floaters to create some kind of screen. So here we've got a couple of extra players. We may not have those players. If you're going for a two turns touchdown, there is a likelihood that you might be um, pressured. Or if you're an agile team that focuses on fast offense, then there's a good chance you may be down a couple of players. So you may not have spare players. But what you want to do is use your reserve players to create barricades between your cage and your opponents now there's a couple of ways to do that you can tag your opponent's players or you can just create like i said some uh some some blockers to create a bit of a screen in the way now this works great with wood elves who've got movement seven edge two plus linemen this works great with skaven and if you've got a human team with a couple of catchers actually what it is really good to do is movement seven is more than fast enough to get you a two-turn touchdown without any go for it so you can use your lighter faster players to break through and to create screening barricades okay it's fine your catcher can take a punch to the face on turn seven if it's going to mean that they, they can't even touch the ball carrier now what's likely to happen in this situation is your opponent is going to counter strike and if they can they will go straight for the ball carrier we want to put dudes in place so that is as many negative die rolls as possible or they will take out the front blitzer the front blocker of your side cage and put their guy right there and what that will do is mean that on your turn you will have to counter strike before you can punch through that's fine that is gonna happen that is what you are going to expect but this is the kind of the things you need to be aware of you need to form this side cage you need to get the ball to the carrier before you form the side cage and then you need to secure as much as possible all great in theory let's have a look at how to process this against two of the most common setups and the first formation we'll look at is the anchor defense now the anchor defense is normally used when you are playing against an opponent that is stronger than you that is bashier than you because it is designed to essentially shield this center contingent here okay it's very difficult for you to blitz one of these soft targets so this is normally where the throwers and the catchers go this is normally where the gutter runners go now given the chance the opponent may have blitzers on the edge here if they do then you've got an opportunity to swing around and tag them in place that's great but you will essentially have this contingent here free to counter strike one way or the other that's the strength of the anchor defense is it gives you uh it gives you the offense a minimal amount of opportunistic box and kind of maximizes the amount of players that are going to be free to counter strike the downside here is if your opponent is set up in an anchor formation on turn seven or you're ready to score then they want you to score in theory or it's a misplay and it's your opportunity the other thing that can happen is you may not be planning to go for a side cage but if your opponent sets up in anchor the anchor formation and you've got a couple of turns or you want to go for the score you can just hoon it through because this is a really easy uh, situation to create that bit of defense so like we add that bit of offense to create that side cage now we've got the ghost markers here of the players and this is where we want our dudes to be 
We are assuming you're going to get the ball. We're assuming you're going to be able to grab the ball and get it to your catcher. OK, we're going to call this guy a catcher, but he can be a stilty runner. He can be a goblin on an orc team. He can be a gutter runner. He can be a human blitzer. He can even be an ogre if you want. It doesn't matter. All you've got to do is adjust your red and amber zones to make sure that you are happy with where your player is going to end up. One, get the ball to the catcher. Two, we need to create the pocket. Now, in this circumstance, where there's a lot of untagged players, we can just go do that. All right, we can just go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And this is the challenging thing. The deeper you go, the more go for it you will need to pull off. So the faster your runner, the lower down you can keep your side cage and the less go for it will be needed. So a Skaven team is a beautiful one for this because with movement nine gutter runners, it means your launch pad can be super close. If we have count this out, go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. OK, uh, then um, you can afford to have your guy here which means you can afford to have your cage here and here, which means you only need a movement one, two, three, four, five player to build up that piece. Now, this is why Hackflem has been so excellent, because you can use Hackflem as your carrier and all you need is movement, what? Movement five dudes. Actually, with a couple of decent rushes, you can pull that off with a Chaos Dwarf team without any Hobgoblins. They've got Hobgoblins, so actually a movement six team with a movement nine player good to go moving eight players are great too but this is the whole point here you create that launch pad based on where you are willing to take those risks if you're going turn seven into turn eight then actually being able being willing to take a couple of go for it from the last turn of the game is not the worst thing in the world what you should do wherever possible is stack your go for it's on the ball carrier next turn all right because and because what you don't want to do is fumble the ball in this zone here. If you're happy fumbling the ball here because it's going to be very difficult for your opponent to collect and then counter score. But anyway, one, get the ball to your ball scorer. Then you position your players against the edge, bring the ball carrier up and you've got your side cage there. Then the next thing to do is to create as much interference as possible. Now, one of the cool things you can do in this formation, and so we're assuming that your opponent has set up the anchor and gone wide. What we want to do is we want to tag the opponent's players. We want to mark them. Sorry, is that what we call it now? Marking them? Marked player? Open player? Yeah, marked player. You want to mark them because what that's going to do is that's going to force your opponent to roll dice. The more dice you make them roll, the more chance they're going to have to burn their re-rolls or just roll a double skull, roll a double one and end their turn and you are free to go. So normally you'd be lining up your dudes and trying to plan out as many blocks as possible. That's not what we're doing right now. We're trying to score a touchdown. But what you can do is you can use a tight end. Now, a tight end is a player in American football that lines up to the side of the line of scrimmage, can block, can fight, can catch and can run. OK, they're a bit of catch all. The ultimate tight end player is the uh, the nobility blitzer, where it's got movement seven, block and catch. OK, it's an excellent all rounder player. What we want to do, though, is put him on the edge here. And where we've got this situation down here, we've got this guy marked. And if we don't have these two dark players here, I've marked them because actually we may not have those players. It's still going to work. What we can do is use this guy to uh, mark these two players, uh, negating their assists. Then we can use these two assists here to get this lineman to take a block on this lineman here. Now, he pops him back and moves up and then all of these linemen are tagged. And then you've got an extra dude free. And that's really important because then that guy can go one, two, three, four, five, six. And then if I am movement seven, I can mark a guy there and then I can bring this guy around to mark this player here. And then I can bring my one up there, two up there, catcher up there. And then if I've got another player in reserve, I can bring him around and create a bit of a screen. Now, you want to tag and mark as many players as possible or create a screen. Now, a screen in Blood Bowl is a situation here where you've got overlapping tackle zones that mean your opponent will have to dodge through to get to the ball carrier. So these two X's are wild players, all right? We may have them, we may not have them. That's where we want them to be if we've got players that are fast enough and if we can create a gap to move them through. And the reason for that is if you look at the way these tackle zones are lining up, if one of our opponent's counter-striking players wants to go through and get to uh, one of the edges of our cage, they are going to have to go a very long way. Let's go one, two, three, four, five. Uh, hang on, we're going to go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine for the blitz. 
that means they're going to have to have a movement seven blitzer with two rushes who is probably going to be blocking on a one die block unsupported that is going to happen that is quite likely to happen your opponent can get an opportunity to attack an edge of your cage but they're going to have to roll those rushes. They're going to have to take a bad block to get in the way. Now, what they could do is just plop a guy here, but then that just gives you the strength to blitz up and out and create a running lane on the second turn. So forming a side cage, collect the ball, get it to your ball scorer, build your cage and secure it with a screen and mark as many of your opponent's players as possible. That's the other thing we haven't mentioned here is that if you've got enough players to have one wide, run them round and just get in the way, mark as many of your opponent's players as possible, give them the blocks because you're about to take the win. So running a two turn touchdown using a side cage against a uh, defensive formation like the anchor, it's easy to build and then you kind of just have to stand there and take your opponent's best shot to take you out. There are some defensive formations that we advise you use against fast teams that are going to make it a bit more challenging. And the Chevron is the second formation that we're going to look at today. And the Chevron is a good kind of mid-range defense. Okay, It keeps your players close enough to be able to counter strike, but puts tackle zones everywhere. And if we're playing a strength three team against a strength three team here, then it becomes very difficult. And there's a couple of things we're going to have to do. So We'll talk through this as an offensive team now, trying to form a side cage against the Chevron defense. So we've got the same plan as before. Secure the ball, get it to the ball carrier. Okay, we've done that. Now what we need to do is blitz through and build our side cage. If you look at the way the Chevron defense stacks up tackle zones, there is no way to do that without actually having to take out an opponent's player. That is to be expected. And this is the fun bit. The fast teams don't normally have a strong blitzer. This is the beautiful element of balance here when it comes to Blood Bowl. Chaos are not bad at this, okay? You've got movement six beastmen. That's fast enough to be able to score in two turns. You will need some rushes though, okay? So be prepared for that. But you end up with a strength four blitzer. Skaven, again, actually kind of sneak their way through this by having a rat ogre. However, the Rat Ogre is definitely a risky play. But you've got wild uh, animal savagery, haven't you? Animal savagery? Unchanneled fury? Animal savagery. The one where you will do the thing you want to do, but it might cost you a player for you to do it. And that's cool. Because if you look at the way this Chevron defense is set up, if you are a strength three player, unless you've got a cheeky guard one, which you may not have, do love guard in a fast team, you're going to be blocking strength three on strength three on the edge here. It's going to be a one die block. Now, actually, if you've got a blitzer and you're able to block with the blitzer, that is a one in six chance of it going wrong. A block will knock them down. Uh, push, start, gets them out of the way. And what we're trying to do is push them out of the way. Because you were going to choose one side. Now, if you've gone heavy left or heavy right with a flank offense, you know which way you're going. You just have to hope it all goes to play. So getting through this line means you will have to take off the edge defender here. The edge defender, if the opponent is playing a chevron, could be a high strength player. It might be a blitzer, but it probably won't. The blitzers on the opponent side will probably be in the middle here, kind of protected and ready to be the counter strike piece. So the edge piece may be, may be slow, may be heavy, but also may just be a lineman because it may be all they've got left. So you've got a couple of choices. You can bring a guy up and put him there. Put a guy there. And then take your blitzer and blitz through with two dice and get this guy gone. You can do that. But what happens then, and this is the beautiful thing about the Chevron defense, is this guy is still going to be standing. And this square will be empty. But to get in there and out, you will be taking a dodge. Now, this is not a problem if you've got some gutter runner. So if you've got a gutter runner pack, actually, it's just a two plus plus dodge out there to get up here and build your side cage. That's fine. So you can normally stack a guy there, bring the blitzer in, blitz through, and then leave the blitzer in the way there. What the blitzer will do there is mark that player, mark that player, and then you can gutter runner through and create a nice little tasty side cage up there with movement 9 and edge 2 plus plus with dodge. If you're not playing a team that is quite as gifted as Skaven when it comes to the breakthrough, you have a choice to make. You can stack a dude and go for a 2 plus uh, 2 dice or you can just go for the 1 dice and hope to push away. So in this circumstance what you do is get the ball to the ball carrier because it's actually in a reasonable place and then go 1, 2, 3, 4 for the block, then 5, 6, 7, rush to there you're looking 
essentially for two two pluses if you've got a movement seven blitzer if you've got a reroll, you're going to be okay. Um, but you will have to do that because then you can knock this guy here. Then you can bring the other Blitzer up to form the second part of your cage. Bring your ball carrier up and then use your reserve detachment. Maybe kick a lineman away and then bring these guys up here to mark as many opponents players as possible. The difficulty with the uh, side cage versus the chevron is that unless you are a very fast team, it might be unlikely for you to be able to bring up enough fast support to uh, successfully screen the top edge of the cage. This is a part of the side cage that you have to accept. There's two kind of uh, there's two kind of ways around that. The first is if you are able to clear out a bit of a running lane here in the line of scrimmage. So by doing that, you move this guy up here using this lineman. Uh, then you can afford to follow up then you can do cross blocks and move this guy there with this lineman and not follow up giving us support here to move this guy to there and then what we'll end up is with a lineman there a lineman there and a lineman there with if this guy is knocked down that's the kind of key here is you need to knock down one of these guys you will be able to create a running lane and from that if you've got any support here you can filter through and just get in the way or maybe even mark one of your opponent's blitzers now if they're set up like this and you can't mark this guy it's going to be a very easy one two three four five six seven eight there's quite a there's quite a couple of loops around there for them to be able to get a block it may not be a great block on the top edge of your cage but it will be on the top edge of your cage and they may just mark the top edge of the cage but be prepared to have to counter blitz something out of the way here now if your opponent's a very fast team they may stack up defense here but it's a long way to go for them to do that and if you can get any way of marking these players it will definitely stop it what's going to happen in this circumstance is you are going to end up up here with two of your opponent's players versus three or four of yours and it's going to force you to have to blitz through but you should be able to at least make it an even or better blitz and failing that your ball carrier may just be something like a gutter runner or a wood elf who's got a pretty good opportunity of dodging his way through it now let's flip it round and talk about stopping the side cage so we kind of talked through this already but if you're running the chevron defense if they want to go through and build a side cage you won't be able to stop them, but you are forcing them to probably make some rushes because they're having to run around the edge just to solidify their position and maybe take a bad block. If you're running the Chevron defense for a team, watch um, any one of the formation videos. So if you're thinking, well, I'm going to run Nurgle, watch the Nurgle formation videos. It will give you some really cool tips on how to stack this in the best place. But if you've got a stand firm piece, put it on the edge. That is going to absolutely ruin their day. If you've got a strength four piece and they are not a strength four team, put it in the way it's going to be very very difficult for them to do the goal here is to look and create as many overlapping tackle zones as possible but let's assume your opponent does manage to they cheek their way through they take a one die block knock this dude down here i put their two guys up there with the ball carrier and they manage to get a screening agent up here as well then it's down to you because of the way the chevron defense overlaps there will be no way for your opponent to mark your reserve contingent here without them taking some pretty strenuous tasked roles because they can only blitz one dude they'll be blitzing the edge dude if they don't blitz the edge dude then they have to come through the middle if they come through the middle they will not have enough movement to form a side cage this will be a weak center cage and that is a video for another time now your opponent has come through and they have built this side cage what do you do it very much depends on your movement. If you are a middling team with movement six, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, it is probably going to be a case of you having to pull off some rushes to get your players in situation. But what you want to do, in theory, is get a guy here. That's an awfully long way to go. So you've got two options. You will probably have one mobile defensive unit and hopefully a support. You've got that two choices. One, two, three four five six and blitz then seven here okay or you follow up and end up here anything you do here is going to end up with your opponent having a good block or good blitz against you so it depends on the matchup here if you've got a good combat piece if you've got a chaos warrior here one two three four five take the blitz six and actually i'm happy knocking him there but you may have to take a rush to go through it 
your goal is to take out the head rusher here, the top edge of this cage, the one closest to the touchdown zone, because that will create tackle zones here. If you can mark the ball carrier, they will have to take dodges, and if they have to dodge through your tackle zones, that just doubles it down. If you can't get into range or it's not a profitable block, then actually being able to put a guy here is going to force your opponent to run through. So, best option being able to block away and then just being on the ball carrier if you can't do that then creating a screen of your own is the best opportunity to make them take dice what you want to do is mark each of these players if possible now if this guy is not stunned you may very well have an opportunity to bring an element up here an element here to tag both of these players and then blitz from underneath and what that will do is that will end up with an offensive piece of your side there and two offensive pieces here and here that creates an outrageous number of tackle zones and your opponent is going to have to fight their way through it the side cage is the mutually assured destruction element of blood bowl this is kind of in it to win it if it works out there are going to be some times where you can't stop it there will be some times where you absolutely can stop it where they go wrong and you just get the ball in your own backfield with three or four of their players and it is now your turn on your turn for an offensive drive and that's the risky element of the side cage but chevron defense forces your opponent to make a lot of rolls here and then you get the choice to blitz one end of the cage to get somebody on the ball carrier and bring up as much support as possible but check your discipline when it comes to uh, your tackle zones because you want to be counter screening wherever possible but marking low agility players is even better which brings us to the final piece of this Ben talk. Stopping the side cage, the column defense is perfect for this. Now, I love the Chevron because it gives you a nice bit of flexibility, but stacking up in the column defense here, it leaves the center zone absolutely flipping wide open. Okay, it's risky in that regard, but your opponent is going to have to work super hard to create a side cage. So if you are definitely adamantly terrifyingly worried of a two-turn score and use the column defense your opponent can take out this guy but there will be tackle zones from the guy behind and it is just going to be a tackle zone situation the column defense will straight up stop the side cage you know in regards through to a two-turn touchdown from the line of scrimmage the vulnerability here is that it's not very difficult for your opponent to get a supported block and create a running lane in the middle these guys are already marked bring up a player if they can get it through and play maybe here these guys are both marked this guy will be soon be marked this guy will soon be marked and then actually it's not difficult for them to bring somebody up here and mark both these players and which will leave you two edge defenders here uh, versus a bit of a cage in the middle that's the vulnerability but if you are looking to absolutely stop a two turn score if you're setting up for turn seven and you do not want them to score Go with the column defense. It gives the initiative away a bit, but it stacks up your tackle zones in such a way that 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 easy gung ho, let's roll for it kind of option that the side cage can be. This is going to absolutely stuff it up and we don't see the column defense enough. That is everything I wanted to talk about when it comes to the side cage today. But I do recommend if you want to see it in action, go back and watch the Bonehead Championship. We've just filmed our 15th game of 11s. There's a good mixture of teams. I love the side cage. I use it more than I should. If you want to see it in action, if you want to see it work and you want to see it fail, watch our games because you will see good tactics, bad tactics. And when you are playing Blood Bowl, you will play against people who use good tactics and bad tactics in the same game. You yourself will do the same thing. Blood Bowl is a game of discipline. And it's not about disciplined maneuver on the tabletop as much as it is disciplining yourself to not just go for the YOLO plays. I love it. It's awesome. And the side cage is the primo version of that on the battlefield. I love it. I love it and use it far more than I should. And this really is a very exciting element of Blood Bowl. Anyway, guys, thank you very much for watching. I realize this is quite a long video, but it's Theory Thursday. And on Thursdays, we do theory. Anyway, thanks very much for watching. We'll be back soon with more Blood Bowl content. Happy blocking. Thanks very much for watching. We really appreciate your support. If you want to help support the channel even further, please like and subscribe or come join us on our Patreon. We have early access to content. We get loads of feedback from you guys and we try and do competitions as much as we can. Or 
you can get yourself some Bonehead Podcast merch on our Spreadshirt site. So if you want to support a team, especially for the Bonehead Championship, you can pick up a shirt, a mug, things like that. It all helps support the channel and we really appreciate it. Anyway, links below. Thank you very much. Happy blocking. Happy blocking.